life uh, is not too bad. Most things that we want, uh, or most of the basic necessities in life, we can get. And sometimes we can even enjoy life in Malaysia. It's uh, life is not bad. Uh, but when we compare ourselves to the devas, uh, we find uh, that devas have much better blessings. They enjoy life much better than us. And the devas, there are three realms eh, of devas. The lowest is the sensual desire realm. Then the second is the form realm. And the third is the formless realm. The sensual desire realms eh, are the, uh, in the sensual desire realm, beings are controlled by lust and sensual desire. So you have male and female. But in the form realm, to be born there, you have got to attain jhana, one pointedness of mind. And there the beings are unisex, there's no male and female. And their bodies are so bright that they emit light, like the sun, in fact, brighter than the sun. And then the formless uh, realm beings, uh, although they are called formless, uh, they have a very fine form, so fine uh, that all other beings cannot see them. That's why they are considered formless. Uh, so, in the sensual desire realm, uh, there are six levels of heavens. The fifth and the sixth level, uh, the devas there have so much blessings uh, that whatever they wish for, uh, they just think about it uh, and it appears before them. See. So practically, uh, the, the world you could see as at their feet, uh, whatever they want, uh, just wish, just make a wish, uh, and everything appears before them. But we, as human beings, uh, our blessings is not so great. So some things in life we want, we can get, but some things in life we cannot get. But not too bad uh, compared to the three woeful plains below us. The Buddha said that most beings, you know, after we pass away, will fall in the rose realm because of lack of merit, lack of blessings. You know. After we have lived our life as human beings, you know, we have used up a lot of our blessings. You know. So most of us you know, will go into the rose realm unless we create a lot of blessings in this lifetime. You know. And those beings, you know, that how others uh, will be reborn in the animal and hell realm. Uh, so you see uh, that uh, blessings are quite important in uh, the spiritual realm. But we come back to money. Uh, money is in everybody's mind. Uh, even if we achieve uh, the wealth that we want uh, and we become richer, uh, are we totally happy? Uh, you find uh, a lot of rich people uh, are not happy. Uh, I'm sure many of you read the papers and, and uh, see uh, that Paris Hilton is one of those uh, uh, very rich uh, poor girls. Uh, uh, very rich but not happy. Uh, but does it show? It shows uh, that she has the wealth blessings, the blessings of wealth but not the blessings of happiness. And then there are some people uh, who are so rich uh, but are not contented. They are greedy for more and more and more, never satisfied. A lot of people are like that. Initially we want to become millionaire. After we become millionaire, we want to become billionaire. After you become a billionaire, you want to be listed in the Forbes magazine or something like that. So, this type of person, outside now, we see him as a very rich billionaire or billionaire. But, that greedy mind makes him actually a hungry ghost inside. So, he has a mind of a hungry ghost, although he looks very wealthy. Outside, uh, and that's very dangerous. 
Because uh, if we have the mind of hungry ghost, that could be reborn as a hungry ghost. Uh, and then there are some people uh, who are very rich, but then uh, suddenly they pass away. So, what does it show? It shows they have the blessings of wealth, <coughs> but not the blessings of life, long life. So that is another shortcoming. Huh? So you see, huh, this wealth alone huh, is not enough. There are some people who are very rich, huh, but they are talked by poor health, always sick. <coughs> Throughout their life, huh, they are always sick. Uh, so they don't have the blessings of good health. And then there are some people, they strive hard to make money, yeah? and then they become rich, maybe a millionaire. And they become a millionaire for many years, and after a good many years, and suddenly they become bankrupt. Uh, and also like such people. This shows uh, that their blessings uh, is not sufficient to last so long. Uh, after some time, the blessings is used up, so they become bankrupt or something like that. And then, if you have wealth also, uh, when you die, are you going to get a good fever? Uh, probably not. Many years ago, uh, we had the richest man in the world, uh, was called Howard Hughes. Right? Uh, he's well known as a big boy. He was so wealthy and yeah. he was dating all the Hollywood film stars. Yeah. And then it was uh, reported in the papers uh, that when he was old, uh, just before he died, he became a recluse. He locked himself up at his condominium, refused to see people, refused to cut his hair, he kept his hair very long. In other words, uh, he at the behavior of a ghost, which is not a very good sign. So, according to karma, having used up all these blessings, yeah, he didn't do enough merit, yeah, so he might be heading for the ghost wealth. So you see here that wealth is only one of the many blessings that we require in life. Yeah. So many others are important. We want long life to enjoy our wealth. We want good health. Uh, we want our wealth to continue. We want to have a good rebirth. And besides that, uh, there are some people uh, which uh, they were born beautiful, right? Or handsome. And some people wish uh, they were smarter. So brains is another. Uh, being intelligent uh, is another blessing that people want. To be respected or loved uh, is another blessing people want uh, and sometimes cannot get. So to be happy at we, uh, we want to have as many blessings as possible, right? Uh, so that our happiness is complete. And how to get it? Uh, luckily, uh, somebody like the Buddha uh, has shown us the way. The Buddha taught the Dhamma. And the Dhamma is about skillful living. How to live our life skillfully. Now it is very important uh, to be skillful in everything. You know? Even eating also. If you are not skillful, you, know, you have a lot of cholesterol. And you have a stroke, high you know, blood pressure, diabetes, and all that. So you have to eat smart also. So living also, we have to be smart. So the Buddha, is caused uh, about 5,000 sutras over a period of 45 years when he showed us the way to lead a skillful life. Uh, and many of these uh, sutras uh, are actually uh, very enlightening, uh, like the Chulam, Chulam Kama Vibhanga Sutra and the Majjhima Nikaya 1, 3, and 5, where it talks about karma, why people are born different in the world and how to get what you want. For example, if you want to be born beautiful, you'll get angry, uh, 
many times you get angry, you yeah? know, fierce, your face is not so really fierce, yeah? uh, Every day you make your face become fierce, yeah? naturally, you will be born, ugly. Yeah? If you want to be healthy, you will torture other beings. If you torture other beings, make their body painful, yeah? and it's natural, you will be born with a body that you know, is still a lot of pain. And then your suttas, like the Mangala Sutta, also blessings, how to achieve the highest blessings. Uh, inside there, uh, we have all this formula, uh, 38 things. So it is very important uh, for us to study the suttas. The suttas are extremely important. That's why the Buddha wanted all his disciples uh, to listen to his suttas. That's why he called his disciples savakas. Hearers or listeners, certain word in Chinese. So if you consider yourself a disciple of the Buddha, a follower of the Buddha, you should study his words. And his words, his real words are in the earliest suttas, earliest nikayas, the four nikayas, Giga, Nikaya, Majjhima, Sakyuta, Aguntara. So if we study his words, then we will slowly uh, change our lifestyle to accord with the Dharma and slowly we become more and more happy people. Now, the Buddha taught uh, in the suttas uh, how to be happy uh, by getting the blessings. So this, uh, the Buddha gave this formula, dana, sila, bhavana, to attain punya, blessings. Dana is charity, or generosity. Uh, generally people associate dana with giving money. But it's not only money. Then, how can we say, Ului chut lui, Ula chut la. If you have money, you give money. If you have energy, you give energy. So many other things you can give. You can give kind words. When somebody is grieving, you give that person kind words. When somebody is sick with cancer, you can see that person, console that person. That is also giving, giving kindness. So, Breaking books is uh, the giving of dharma. So in other words, when we do dana, we give happiness to others. And when you give happiness to others, uh, the law of karma vipaka says uh, that happiness comes looking for you. Every now and then, happiness will come and knock on your door. You'll be surprised. Uh, how come you? You get this and you get that. That's a good karma. So that is the first thing. We give happiness to others. And happiness comes back to us. The second thing is sila. Sila is moral conduct. And moral conduct means keeping the precepts which help us to refrain from harming others. For example, the five precepts that Buddha taught that lay people should keep. First one is not to kill. If you don't kill, then you give long life to others and naturally you get back long life. Second one is not to take what is not given. If you don't steal, then when you employ people to work for you, then they won't steal your things. Third is not to commit adultery. If you don't commit adultery, then you don't uh, break up people's families. Then uh, fourth is not to lie or cheat people. Uh, if you lie or cheat people, uh, then uh, people will lie and, and cheat you. Uh, and this precept uh, includes three others, uh, not to speak coarse words, not to carry tales, uh, to cause people to quarrel and not to engage in idle gossip. And the fifth precept is not to take liquor, 
droughts and other intoxicants and to spoil your brain. So basically, you know, these are the five precepts. Also, the Buddha said, lay people, when you earn your livelihood, you should engage in right livelihood, not to harm others. Just as you like to chari makan, other people also have to chari makan. So they should have that day. Don't be so selfish as to only think of yourself. Be considerate to others. So, uh, this precepts, uh, uh, when we keep uh, sila, we keep the precepts, uh, so we don't give suffering to others, we don't kill, we don't steal, etc. And if we don't give suffering to others, uh, suffering does not come knocking on your door. Right? Uh, and then the third thing is bhavana. Bhavana is development of the mind. And development of the mind consists of two things, two parts. One is to study the Dharma. When we study the Dharma, we get wisdom. A lot of things that we should know, we don't know. Then when we study the Buddha's words, then we say, ah, yeah, it's so logical. Why did not think of it before? So you see, common sense is not so common. Not is a bit more common. So, this is the study of the Dharma. Then another part of bhavana is meditation. Meditation is to pray the mind to focus. Our mind is not focused. Most of us, we are, we are chasing after a lot of things in this world. So our mind gets to be very scattered. So when we meditate, we pray the mind to become one-pointed. And this is very important. A lot of people don't understand why uh, this samatha meditation is important. There is in one sutta uh, an incident one, where one very rich layman was so rich uh, that every day he would be entertained by slaves who would sing and dance for him. And he would drink himself until he gets drunk. And every day he would drink and enjoy the uh, slaves uh, singing and dancing for him. So one day when he was drunk, the Buddha walked in front of his house. So when he saw the Buddha, he was surprised. And then he fixed his eye on the Buddha. He concentrated because in his previous life uh, he probably was an ascetic a monk or something. So the sight of the Samana, a monk, roused his interest. So when he focused his eyes on the Buddha, he looked at the Buddha. Then he was able to shake off his drunkenness. Can we do that? Unless you have trained your mind to be one pointed in your drama, you cannot shake off your drunkenness. When you're sleepy, you cannot shake off your sleepiness. But if a person like that uh, can train his mind to be one-pointed, uh, then when he listens to the Dharma, his mind becomes one-pointed. And then he understands the Dharma. Uh, and that was the way uh, many of the Buddha's earliest disciples became Arahants, just by listening to his Dharma talk. That's why this uh, meditation, Samatha meditation is so important. So when we practice bhavana, we study the Dharma and the Dharma shows us the way to lead, to, to lead our life, the path to walk, the noble eightfold path, etc. And then we meditate so that our mind becomes clearer and we can understand the Dharma better. And this gives us more blessings. In fact, these blessings of bhavana is so great that it can bring us out of samsara. It can make you become an Arya. If you listen to the Dharma enough, and your mind is clear enough, you understand the four noble truths, then you have right view. And once you have right view, you are already an Arya. The day in the first path, stream entry. So, 
you can see uh, that once you have changed scheme entry, uh, it means uh, you have an area, and once you have an area, it means that three more full planes uh, are totally shut off for you. You will never be reborn as a ghost. You will be never reborn as an animal. You will be never reborn in the hell realm. So it is so important, you see, to attain stream entry. Once you attain stream entry, you have attained the most precious thing in the world that money cannot buy. So this is the formula for lay people to attain this happiness and the blessings that will give you happiness. But for monks, it is a little bit more. Uh, in the suttas, the Buddha listed out charana, conduct for monks, or practice for monks. And one of the things is contentment. A monk, when a monk renounces, he renounces worldly things, all his property, all his wealth, he gives up. Because you know, he's looking for a higher happiness and worldly happiness. So, after that, uh, uh, the monk practices the precepts. In the monk's precepts, uh, we have 227 precepts. So many precepts. Uh, it is not easy to keep. So the Buddha realized uh, that it is impossible, uh, almost impossible, uh, to keep all the precepts. Uh, when the Buddha was about to pass away, he did say uh, that the minor precepts uh, would be abolished in the Sangha, without it necessary. Now, there is an Indian belief, and I also believe, that every precept you keep, there is this Deva that protects you. How can you say who was sin? So, the more precepts you keep, the more Devas protect you. That's why you see those virtuous monks, those meditation monks, they go deep into the forest alone. And when they go alone into the deep forest or in dark caves, you have the strange beings, powerful beings, some fierce devas and some fierce ghosts. But these beings, they are psychic. So if a monk is virtuous, straight away they know it's a virtuous monk. And instead of harming that monk, they will protect the monk. So it is uh, very good, the more precepts you keep, the more protective you become. So the next time you sit on the bus on the highway and you fall down on the street, you won't be one of those who pass away. And then uh, the monk also gives happiness to others uh, by his conduct. The monk is supposed to be a gentle, harmless being. The monk is not supposed to get angry and you know, all that. Huh? And by becoming a monk, uh, the monk gives the lay people uh, the chance uh, to do dharma. The Buddha did not allow his monk disciples uh, to live alone in the deep forest uh, and feed himself uh, on the fruits uh, and on the roots and on the leaves. The Buddha wanted his monk disciples uh, to live among lay people at least. Uh, at least, uh, even if he lives in a cave or in the forest, uh, to come on Armstrong uh, to give the people the chance to do merit. Uh, so, also, a monk teaches the Dharma to lay people. Uh, and the giving of the Dharma is the highest gift, the Buddha says. Uh, the highest gift is the gift of the Dharma. Uh, so, the, the monk not only accepts, you know, the monk also gives. Uh, Now, we know a lot of our unhappiness, a lot of our suffering uh, comes from the mind. And it comes from the five hindrances. There are five hindrances uh, that give us a lot of suffering. Sensual desire, uh, ill will or anger, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry and doubt. You see sometimes in the newspaper, an old man rapes the granddaughter or a daughter. Why? Because of sensual desire. So that gives him so much suffering. 
So these five hindrances, huh, if we meditate, we practice samatha meditation, huh, we can even eliminate these five hindrances. The Buddha said huh, in the Sutta that if a person has attained jhana, he becomes passionless, he has eliminated the five hindrances. Although the roots are not dug up, but they do not obstruct him anymore. They do not become a problem anymore. And if we can attain one pointedness of mind, the mind becomes a source of great happiness, great bliss. Buddha said in the suttas that an undisciplined mind is a source of great suffering. A disciplined mind is a source of great happiness. An uncontrolled mind is the source of great suffering. A controlled mind is the source of great happiness. So you find that the devas, the higher the devas, the higher heavens you go on, the higher the happiness. And the higher devas, who are those? The higher devas are those with jhana, those who have attained jhana. Where they can abide in bliss for world cycles. So long uh, that in the second jhana plane, uh, Buddha said, uh, those devas there, every day uh, they exclaim, Sukha, 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 bliss up and have an ecstasy feel. <laughs> but not for one hour or two hours, for world cycles, I imagine, millions and millions and millions of years have bliss up. And in the third jhana plane, uh, the Buddha said, uh, they are so happy, they should see. should ascend. Cannot utter a word. This comes to the river. So that's how uh, we get the higher happiness uh, by training our mind. And the highest happiness we can get uh, is Nibbana. Buddha said Nibbana Paramahamsa Sukha. Nibbana is the highest place. And so if we want to attain Nibbana, we become monks and nuns. To aim for the highest happiness. So that is the formula for monks and nuns: eh? contentment, keeping precepts, giving happiness to others, meditating, meditating to eliminate the five hindrances, and practicing the noble eightfold path for the highest happiness. So in conclusion, eh? I like to say uh, that in the Buddha's teachings, uh, the Buddha did not say uh, that money is wrong. The Buddha said, for lay people, uh, enjoy life, uh, make as much money as you can, own as much property as you can, but use it wisely. Uh, make yourselves happy, make your family happy, make your relatives and friends happy. But the Buddha also said, don't eat stale food. What is stale food? Here, food is food left over from yesterday or the day before yesterday. And that refers to the riches you have now. The riches you have now is the result of the good karma you created in the past life or two past lives or three past lives ago. So that is stale food. So the Buddha says uh, you have to get new food and buy creating the merit now, create more blessings now so that to ensure that you get good food again in the next life or even this life. So remember, don't just rest on your blessings from the past life. You have to create more blessings from down and seal above. The other thing you have to remember is wealth is only one ingredient of the happiness cake. There's a lot of there's a lot of ingredients in the happiness cake, right? Like you want to have a long life, you want to have a good, strong, healthy body, like David Beckham. You want to be intelligent, you want to be beautiful, handsome, etc. So not only wealth is important, all the other things are important. That's why the Buddha said you have to practice this dhana, sila, and bhavana. The other thing we have to remember is that worldly currency is like banana notes. You know what banana notes? 
Only old people like me will know. When the Japanese left after the Second World War, they left a lot of Japanese money. When they came to Malaysia, I think 1942, and they left in 1945, they thought they were going to stay here forever. So they started to print a lot of Japanese money. They don't call it Pengit. So when they surrendered in 1945, and the British came back, all that money was worthless. So when I was a small boy, yeah, we had plenty of Japanese notes to play with. And those were called banana notes because the banana tree was, was on that, on that uh, money. Uh, uh. Now, banana notes are uh, uh, no more of any use. So all the wealth that we have now, uh, when we pass away, uh, becomes banana notes. We cannot bring it along to the next world. A lot of people don't know when their relative passes away and people have burned paper money. Yeah. Before, even you burn the real ringgit note or so on, it becomes a banana note the other side. Uh, so, only uh, spiritual currency uh, is value. Spiritual currency, uh, if you develop it in this lifetime, you can bring it along to the next life, you can use it. This is more than international. Uh, inter life, life after life, you can use it. Uh, and the last thing I like to say is in the Samyutta Nikaya, I think Saka Devaraja Samyutta, there was an episode, a story about a poor beggar. He listened to the Dharma and he had faith, so he used to come to the monastery and listen to the Dharma and he started to practice to keep his seal up and practice to be generous etc. And then when he was re when he died, he was reborn in the heaven of the 33 with Saka Devaraja. And he became so handsome and bright, his body and his light outshone a lot of devas. So they were very surprised, who is this person so looking so great here? So when they started to investigate, they found that he was a poor beggar. So they were very annoyed. It's not only a poor beggar, now he's not shining all of us. Ah, don't look down on the poor beggar. Outside only he's poor, but inside he's not poor. So I say to the monk, a monk is called a bhikkhu. Bhikkhu comes from the word big, actually became the English bag. So the bhikkhu means a beggar. And this word the Buddha, Buddha purposely used for his monks. The Buddha called his monks bhikkhu, beggar. But lay people cannot call a monk bhikkhu. It's impolite to call the monk beggar. Right? Uh, so he should always call the monk bhante. Uh, but the Buddha called his monks beggars. So just because the Bhikkhu uh, begs for his food, uh, don't look down on him outside. Uh, he doesn't have a scent to his name, uh, doesn't have a ringgit to his name, but very wealthy inside. Uh, so I'll end here.